Now is, is my pleasure to introduce the Professor Patrice Simon from the University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse. Patrick uh, Simon is distinguished professor at the University Paul Sabatier. His research activities are focused on the modification of material and electrolytes interface in electrodes for electrochemical energy storage device, such as supercapacitors. His warm aim a better understanding the transport and absorption or insertion of ions from an electrolyte in the porous materials used in electrode materials. I hope that uh, his talk will enjoy our attendance. Thank you. Organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, to, to this conference, and I will speak today about uh, free and two-dimensional materials for uh, electrochemical capacitors for supercaps. So I will briefly start by, by a few basics on supercapacitors. So you have here a Ragoni plot where you can see uh, the specific power versus specific energy density, where you have batteries, lithium-ion batteries, which are energy storage devices. So if you make a parallel with uh, a sport, a battery is like a marathoner. And then, on the other hand, you have capacitors, very high power devices, which can store only a few amounts of energy, but can deliver this energy in, very, uh, in a few milliseconds. And in between, to fill the gap between these two devices, you have supercapacitors. So supercapacitor is a high power device, but has 20 times less energy density than batteries. So a supercap is like a sprinter. It can deliver all its energy within tens of seconds. So, um, applications of, uh, of these uh, devices are mainly for power delivery and energy recovery. So most of the applications today are uh, with, uh, for automotive. And you can see here, this is for trams, where you have a roof full of uh, supercaps. And when the tram breaks, then you can recover, harvest the uh, breaking energy. And then you can help uh, the trams for electric drive for tens of uh, hundreds of meters. And also you have a, another very interesting application where you can have a, a bus which has stops each uh, one kilometer. And what you can do is that you can really recharge as fast as you, as you, uh, as you discharge the supercast, meaning that you can recharge these devices in a few seconds. And the autonomy is about two kilometers and you have stops between, uh, distance between stop is uh, 800 meters. And then the last application is stop and start where you can uh, crank a thermal engine based on a super cap, uh, uh, super, uh, altern um, alternator based on super cap uh, powered. Okay, so um, the reason for this uh, um, high power performance lies in the charge storage mechanism. In fact, when you put one electrode inside one electrolyte, if you inject negative charges into this uh, electrode, you have ions of the electrolyte which can balance the charge. By doing that, you make a capacitance. This is called the double layer capacitance, and this value is about 10 to 20 microfarad per square centimeter. So the idea is to use this uh, electrostatic storage, but what you are going to use is not a flat planar electrode, you are going to use a very highly porous carbon electrode with very high surface area, 1500, 2000 square meter per gram. And then what you can see is that during charge, these are the two electrodes, the electrolyte. We when you inject electrons inside this porous carbon, you absorb cations here. And if you have very high surface area, you can store beyond 100 ferrets per gram of carbon. So that's the way the charge is stored. It's a surface storage, very uh, fast, very uh, fastly available uh, charge. And then um, the limitation is the cell voltage. If you use non aqueous electrolyte, you can reach 3 volts. So, uh, the next challenge for supercap is to increase the energy density, which is given by uh, the half of the capacitance multiplied by voltage square, to reach uh, beyond 20 watt hour per kilogram, to be able to, uh, to, power, uh, uh, to power devices for, um, I would say, minutes and more. So what first thing is to try to work on improving the capacitance, see? And this is work we are doing on, uh, on, uh, on the carbon electrolyte interface. I will uh, give you examples of uh, uh, what we are doing on, in this field. And the second way is to move, still to increase the capacitance, is to move from carbon to other materials which can show different charge storage mechanisms. 
Obviously, also, one way is to increase the, the, the maximum voltage of a supercast, but this is a work where you have to design new electrolytes, and this is a holy grail that people from batteries also are chasing, so it's quite complicated. But so that I will focus today only on these two points. Okay, first, the work on uh, uh, carbon. So, we have a Professor Gogozzi who will give a talk uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, years ago, we, um, we have designed a modern material. This modern material is a porous carbon. So to prepare this porous carbon, we started from a titanium carbide. We did the chlorination at different temperature. You remove the titanium here from, uh, from titanium carbide, and you end up with a carbon. And this carbon is porous. Depending on the chlorination temperature, you can prepare. This is a chlorination temperature. This is a porous volume versus a pore size, carbon pore size. You can prepare carbons with pore size controlled. You can tune and control the pore size of a carbon from, I would say, 0.6 to 1 nanometer. And you have very high specific surface area. And so what you, what you do at the lab is you, you prepare this powder, this model material. You mix this powder with, uh, uh, with a binder, uh, Teflon, and then you prepare pellets. You have one separator, which is cellulose. You put electrolyte. The electrolyte is non aqueous Typically, this is tetraethyl ammonium tetrafluoroborate in acetonitrile, and then you do an electrochemical test. And the test here is a cyclic voltammetry, for instance, where you control, in fact, the potential scan rate from 0 to 3 volt. And uh, uh, this is the, uh, the capacitance. The charge is capacitance multiplied by V. So the current is the capacitance divided by the dV of DT. If dV of DT is constant, if you control the potential scan rate, then you, you end up with a constant current. Okay, so this is a rectangular square cyclic voltammetry. It means that you only charge and discharge with double layer. This is an electrochemical signature of a supercap. Okay, a couple of years ago, what we did with this uh, porous carbon, this is a capacitance versus a carbon pore size. These are points from the literature. What we observed is that we, we reported a very high increase of capacitance when the carbon pore size was below one nanometer. So uh, this was uh, the beginning of a huge uh, amount of work to try to understand why the capacitance, when you confine ions inside small pores, why you increase a lot the capacitance and why uh, we were able to uh, uh, improve uh, uh, the performance of supercap. So basically, uh, the question is how we can uh, design new um, electrochemical methods to understand the ion confinement in the carbon nanopore. So you have a sketch here where you have a, 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 this is a carbon electrode in green, electrolyte, for example, the positive carbon electrode, oh, sorry, it's blue, um, and then you have electrolyte ions between the two electrodes. And what we are interested in is to understand how the ions go inside these pores, what is the ion environment in these pores, and how, what about the ion dynamics inside this, uh, this uh, nanoporous network. So to do that, to try to, to understand how the ions are adsorbed in these nanopores, understand the, uh, the electrochemical performance, you need advanced tools. And I'm going to present you a set of results based on uh, quartz crystal microbalance in situ and MR, and uh, recent results also from uh, X-ray scattering and modeling. Okay, first, EQCM, quartz crystal, electrochemical quartz crystal microbalance. So the goal here, the idea was to try to measure the extent of dissolvation of ions when they enter nanopores. So what you do is you take a piezoelectric quartz, which has a, a resonance frequency, and you put, uh, you, you put drops of, uh, of porous carbon onto it with, with a binder, and you use this quartz as a working electrode in a cell. And during your electrochemical polarization, you have uh, uh, the quartz which is, uh, oscillates at a resonance frequency, and during the electrochemical polarization, depending on the ions entering or leaving the electrodes, you have a change of resonance frequency, and you can correlate the change of resonance frequency together with the mass change of the electrode. And obviously, if you plot the charge passed into the electrode, and if you divide by the weight, this is a Faraday's law. You can go back to the weight of the, the molar weight of the species going in and out. So these are first results. Uh, we used the uh, EMI TFSA, which is a ethyl methyl imidazolium uh, uh, salt, dissolved in acetonitrile, and we used a porous carbon with no one nanometer per size. So these are the cyclic voltammetry, current versus uh, potential. And you start from OCV, you go to negative potentials, negative charges. So this is a rectangular shape cyclic voltammetry. Here, in that case, you absorb cations because you go to negative charges, negative potentials. And this is here associated with change of frequency of a quartz. So you can see that there is a mass change during the polarization. 
On the other hand, if you start from the uh, zero potential, if you go to positive charges, you see that the cyclic voltammetry is rectangular. You absorb mainly anions and you desorb anions, and you have a change of a frequency. So it means that there is a change of weight. So what we have done was uh, just to, to integrate the charge during the cyclic voltammetry and plot the weight versus the charge. So this is this plot. This is the weight change of the electrode versus the charge, positive charge, negative charge, when you go to negative potential and positive potential. And obviously, the theory, delta M divided by Q, is a Faraday's law. So you have here the theoretical lines for adsorption of here the cation, NEAT, EMI plus, the molar weight is 111 gram per mole, and here the anion. Okay? So what you can see is that when you go to negative, potential, negative charges, when you inject electrons, you are supposed to absorb cations. This cation is this one. But what you see is that you absorb more weight than the theoretical weight of the cation needs. So it means that the difference is the number of solvent molecules entering the pores with the cation. And you can just calculate that one cation goes in with 3.6 average solvent molecules. And if you compare to the uh, solvation number of a cation EMI plus inside acetonitrile, in a bulk electrolyte, you can see that you have seven to eight solvent molecules around. Here, when the ion is confined into a pore of one nanometer, you have a partial dissolvation. So this dissolvation is the reason why you can increase the number of ions that you put inside this, uh, this carbon. On the other hand, if you go to positive charges here, Normally, you are supposed to play with anion absorption, TFSI minus. However, you see that here, at medium charge, the slope is less, the experimental weight is less than the theoretical weight. So what does it mean? It means just that in this region, when you inject, for instance, one positive charge, 0.5 anions are entering, 0.5 cations are leaving. So it's a different storage mechanism here based on ion exchange uh, ion, anion in cations out. And this is very important for a supercap electrode because it means that here, uh, first, you confirm, you, 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 demonstrate, you evidence that there is desolvation of ions, but also what you uh, highlight is that you have two different charge storage mechanisms depending on the electrode polarity. And this is very important because this controls the ion dynamics inside the porous networks. So if you decrease the carbon pore size, if you go to 0.6 nanometer pore size, what you see is that on positive charge, there is no weight change. So the pores are too small to allow anions entering. On negative charge, here, basically, you can still calculate a uh, number of uh, uh, solvation, and you can see that you find that one cation enters with 1.4 acetonitrile molecule. So it means that the more you can find, the more you dissolvate the ions. And uh, so this is uh, uh, also an evidence. This explains why all these ions can access pores smaller than the size of the solvated ion. J the reason is just desolvation, partial desolvation, which was not trivial. However, to go further, we need additional uh, analytical method because here you see the experimental slope is 179 gram per mole. So it can be one cation entering with two acetonitrile molecules, as I mentioned, but it can be this case, one cation entering with five solvent molecules while three solvent molecules are leaving. So to try to uh, stay between these two, uh, 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 these two possibilities, we did some in situ NMR experiment. So this was done with uh, Claire Gray at the Cambridge University. And basically we, we took a, a porous carbon and we modified a little bit the electrolyte, which is a um, phosphonium, uh, tetraethyl phosphonium cations and BF4 minus anions. And we designed a, a specific cell. So this is a supercap cell, positive electrode, negative electrode. But we were able to put only one electrode in the coil. So that uh, we, we, what we did was uh, a polar, um, we recorded several NMR spectra at different constant potentials. And this is an example of a spectra we can, uh, we can have on, uh, for the uh, fluorine and for phosphonium. What you see, you have two peaks. This peak corresponds to ions inside the pores, inside the pores of the carbon, and this peak corresponds to the ions uh, in the free electrolyte around the carbon particles. So 
Uh, the difference why you have a shift is just because of the uh, uh, ring current effect due to the uh, graphitic domains of, of the carbon. So what we did was uh, we did a calibration study, and by integrating the area under the peak, you can go back to the to the ion population inside the poles are different but at different potentials, and this is what we did. So this is the cell voltage, the potential of the uh, of a cell, and this is the change of anion and cation population. So when you go to when your electrode is, po is polarized negatively, means that you inject negative charges. What you see is that the number of cations increases to balance the charge, and the number of anions stay constant. On the other hand, when you inject positive charges in your electrode, you see that anions population is increasing, cation population is decreasing. And this, this is a very nice confirmation of what we observed by EQCM. So this is a counter-ion adsorption, and no change in anion population. So it means that here, cations are entering desolvated. And here, this is the ion exchange mechanism. One anion in, one cation out when you inject two positive charges. So that's uh, very intriguing because we don't know yet why anion population stays inside a negatively charged electrode. And this is, um, we have still a lot of things to do to understand uh, this, this phenomenon. And we're working on the solvent polarity effect, hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity of, uh, of a carbon. Uh, but this is really a clue to understand uh, uh, the charge transfer, the charge storage mechanism in supercap electrodes. Okay, another thing is deals with uh, uh, another kind of electrolyte, which is in fact solvent-free electrolytes. So basically, if you take EMI TFSI, so this EMI plus cation, imidazolium TFSI minus anion, without any solvent, which is an ionic liquid. The main interest is that you, you play with real ion sizes. Okay? There is no solvation share. So we did a couple of years ago uh, an experiment, and we reported the capacitance versus the carbon pore size. And what you see is that we observe a maximum capacitance at 0 0 0.7 nanometer. 0 0.7 nanometer, when the carbon pore was 0 0.7 nanometer, maximum capacitance, it was very surprising because you see the size of an ion here, 0 0.76, 0 0.79. So the maximum capacitance was when the pore size was close to the ion size. And this is something which was very uh, intriguing to us at the time. And we, uh, uh, since uh, 2000, we, we wanted to understand what happens in this, uh, in this specific co uh, configuration when you use uh, solvent-free electrolytes and you can find solvent-free electrolytes inside these pores. So recently, last year, we did some uh, X-ray scattering measurement experiment that we coupled with modeling. So the idea is that we took, in fact, EMI TFSI electrolyte. We, confined, we took a carbon, porous carbon, of one nanometer and another sample of 0.7 nanometer carbon, and we confined ions inside these, uh, these, uh, these pores, and we washed the carbon powder, and then we, do, we did some X-ray scattering. And from the X-ray scattering, you can calculate the reduced structure factor, and by modeling, you can go back to ion-ion interaction contributions inside the pores. And when you, uh, when you do a Fourier transform, you can plot the electron radial distribution function, and you go back by modeling to the ion organization in the pores. So I'm gonna give you examples. First, this is the X-ray scattering profiles of EMI TFSI liquid here, EMI TFSI confined in one nanometer carbon pore, EMI TFSI confined in 0.7 nanometer pore. So, for instance, for this bulk liquid, we have calculated the radial structure, the radial structure factor, and we did some modeling. And this is here, this plot is an experimental plot, and the line is the simulated line by modeling. And the simulation is the sum of all the interactions between ions and carbon. So you have, you can, by modeling, you can calculate the anion-cation interaction, cation-cation, anion-anion, and ion, uh, sorry, an intramolecule interaction. So the sum of all these fits gives the simulated here fit, which is in good agreement with the experimental one. So what we did for bulk liquid, we did it also for the liquid confined in one nanometer or 0.7 nanometer pore. And now we have plotted the ERDF just by uh, Fourier transform. 
and this is the electron, de electro electron density versus the distance. Okay. So in this example, for sake of clarity, I just plotted the anion-anion interaction. So in the bulk liquid, you see, anion-anion interaction, what you see is you start to have an ordering at about 0.9 nanometer, and then you have another ordering at another peak at 1.6, 1.8 nanometer. This is in the liquid, bulk liquid, you have uh, alternate layers of uh, EMI, uh, TFSI, and so on. Then, when you confine in one nanometer pore, you see that you start to lose the order, the mid-range order, because obviously when you confine the liquid, you cannot have an ordering of anions and ion structure. And the more you confine, the more you lose the ordering. So first, there is no more mid-range anion-anion ordering when these ions are confined in the pores. But what is really interesting is here. Here you can see that in the liquid, there is, uh, no minimum, uh, there is a minimum of electron, radial, uh, of electron density here at about uh, 0.5, means that there is no ion-ion uh, interaction. When you confine these liquids inside one nanometer, but 0.7 nanometer, you can see here that you start to have a peak appearing. And this means that you can have ions and ions at 0.5 nanometer distance. It means that you... Uh, you can create anion pairs when these ions are confined inside the pores. And this is a partial breaking of a Coulombic ordering. And this is very interesting because it means that, you see here, in the bulk liquid, there is uh, no real ordering. When you confine, you have anions, anion pairs, cation pairs. You create anion pairs and cation pairs, which are not supposed to be created in the bulk liquid. And this is because you create image charges into a carbon. And then you end up in a situation where if you, uh, if you take a, a central anion, and if you count the number of uh, anions in, uh, around this anion, you find that the solvation shell in a bulk liquid is 95% cations around one anion, which is normal. When you confine in 0.7 nanometer pore, around one anion, you have 24% of anions close to this ion, which is not normal, which is a partial breaking of a Coulombic ordering. And this is at the uh, zero potential, but if you go to, if you polarize this electrode, we did an in-situ XRD cell and we were able to uh, inject electrons and holes, so polarize this cell uh, uh, under the beam. This is at, for instance, plus two volt. If you polarize the electrode at plus two volt, you force anions to enter and you end up with about 34% of anions around the anion. You increase the number of co-ion pairs. And then if you polarize at minus two volt for cations in the same, you can see cations exactly the same, you, cre you create cations pair. So this is very intriguing. Uh, it means that you can put more ions inside uh, uh, an electrode when you confine these ions inside the 0.7 nanometer poles. And um, it's a, a kind of new ele electrolyte organization. You create pairs, cation, anion, anion, cation, cations. And this is very intriguing for sure because it's a kind of, uh, 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 you, can, you can think about uh, a new uh, uh, electrolyte organization and structure inside this, uh, these pores. And what we are doing now is to try to understand the role of a solvent and the host matrix to, uh, uh, to have a better idea of uh, uh, the reason why we have such a quiet pair creation. But from a practical point of view, uh, is it interesting to, uh, uh, to confine these uh, 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 materials? We, what we did was to try to prepare porous carbons from olive pit. So we did some activation treatment to try to prepare a porous carbon uh, in the range of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 nanometer to try to see if this effect of, uh, I would say, uh, 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 specific organization of the electrolyte inside these uh, this pores has an impact on the capacitance. So basically, uh, uh, you can see this is a, a, a porous volume versus a pore size. All the pores are below, for these different samples, are below 2 nanometers. But what is interesting is that you can see here, for these two samples, without going into details, for these two samples, uh, most of the porosity is between 0.7, 0.8 nanometer. And we have tested all these, uh, these porous carbon in EMI TFSI, NEAT. And what you see is this NEAT EMI TFSI. For the two samples, uh, 4 and 5, which show the highest porous volume in 0 0.7, 0 0.8 nanometer range, we end up with very, very high capacitance, 180 threads per gram, which is about uh, 
maybe uh, twice than regular carbons uh, in the same electrolyte. Uh, and we also have very outstanding power performance. We can have uh, uh, at, well, these are values, uh, believe me, this is very good power performance. So the point is that this effect of ion confinement of uh, uh, EMI TFSI inside the carbon pores is obviously interesting from a very fundamental point of view to understand why these co-ion pairs can be created, but as also a very uh, interesting practical application because more or less you double uh, the charge raised capacity inside these uh, confined electrodes. Okay, and the other application, obviously we are very interested in uh, studying nanofluidics with these materials. So I have uh, five minutes left to try to um, end up with the second point of my presentation, which is going, going to be uh, uh, more brief because Professor Gogotzi uh, will give an uh, a very complete talk on vaccine materials. But the idea is to uh, move from carbon to other materials, which are called pseudo-capacitive. So in fact, this is a cyclic voltammetry of ruthenium oxide and sulfuric acid. As you can see, it's like a rectangle. So normally it's supposed to be playing only with ion adsorption, electrostatic. However, this material shows redox reaction. It's a very surface confined redox reaction, non limited by diffusion, and this explains why you have this kind of uh, capacitive shape. So these materials are called pseudo capacitive, but they store the charge using fast surface confined redox reactions. So the main two materials uh, which are known to be pseudo capacitive are ruthenium oxide and manganese oxide. But both of them have drawbacks, the cost and the low capacity. But very recently, in uh, uh, URI's group, uh, in 2012, they discovered a new class of 2D materials, two-dimensional materials, which are called muxine. So what is a muxine? A muxine, you start from a max phase. A max phase is a transition metal, uh, A element, which is aluminum, for instance, and X can be carbon, Ti3, Al, C2. And you have Ti3, C2 layers and aluminum. And what you can do is that you etch aluminum layer between the carbide layers. And when you etch the aluminum layer between the carbide by immersion into a lithium fluoride in a hydrochloric acid, you end up with delaminated Ti3C2 materials, which are 2D materials. And these 2D materials are very interesting because in a sulfuric acid, you can play with a redox here of titanium. So it's a pseudo-capacitive material. And these pseudo-capacitive materials store the charge with a surface redox reaction and has very nice and interesting performance. So what, uh, what we did in the, in the lab, we started from, uh, we, we tried to improve the accessibility of the electrolyte to these 2D layer materials. So we started from a colloidal suspension of uh, TI3C2 flakes and we prepared a kind of, we, we did a filtration of these flakes onto a carbon paper and you end up with uh, something which is a 2D material with water molecules in between. And then what we did what was we exchanged the water with sulfuric acid here, just by putting this film into sulfuric acid electrolyte. And then little by little you replace water with sulfuric acid and you end up with uh, Ti3C2 layers pre-intercalated with sulfuric acid. And by this, we, want, we plan to, we, we hope to increase the accessibility of the surface of the electrolyte. And this is a XRD pattern of a, of, a, of a material, the max phase. So when you delaminate the max phase, when you remove the aluminum, you have here the TL3C2. And you can see that you, uh, you have a 2D structure here. And when you intercalate sulfuric acid, you increase, you, uh, sorry, you decrease, the, uh, you, you shift the peaks to a lower uh, theta value, means that you enlarge a little bit the interlayer distance because you have sulfuric acid in between. And we did the electrochemical characterization, and as this is in a sulfuric acid electrolyte, and you can see the pseudo capacitive behavior with symmetric redox peaks, very fast, highly uh, reversible redox reactions, playing with titanium oxidation state here. And then if you plot the change of the capacitance versus the scan rate, you can see that you can reach, for different samples, 1,500 farad per cubic centimeter, which is about 10 times more than carbon electrode. So this is, these are very high specific, um, high volumetric capacitance uh, uh, values, thanks to the improved accessibility of the electrolyte. And also, if you have a look to the gravimetric capacitance, you have more or less uh, a capacitance which is three times that of carbon electrode. 
which is also a very good, a very good result, and very nice power capability. This is a, the change of potential scan rate. So if you scan within one volt, if you scan at uh, one volt per second, it's one second charge, one second discharge. And you can see at one volt, you still have very, very high gravimetric capacity. So these materials are very interesting, for sure. But the point is that, as, you, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we use sulfuric acid electrolyte. So this is still aqueous electrolyte. And obviously, the voltage window is limited to one volt or 1.1 volt. And this is an exchange for this, uh, this uh, electrolyte, this material, sorry. You have to increase the cell voltage to increase the energy density. And you have to move from aqueous to non-aqueous electrolyte, but this is another story. It's more, uh, more complicated. Okay, so that I'm gonna, gonna reach the conclusion because I think I'm, yeah, uh, perfect on time. So first, regarding the, <coughs> sorry, nano size pores. Uh, nano pores are very important for high capacitance, obviously. So you have to design micropulse carbon for super caps. But what is really interesting beyond the practical application is this kind of science you have behind uh, uh, the effect of confinement of ions inside these nanopores. So um, you have this partial breaking of the columbic uh, repulsions, so it means that you have a lot of fundamental studies to do to understand how ions are organized, how ions are moving, absorbed in these nanopores. And um, something which is uh, intriguing is uh, are we able to uh, to try to launch some work on nanofluidics in these nanopores when you have these uh, specific states of uh, co-ion pair creations and so on. So this is something which is uh, very interesting. And also, um, it means that you have to be uh, uh, innovative and think about new advanced techniques or combination of techniques that you can use to study these, uh, uh, these electrolytes confined into the pores. And regarding uh, uh, muxine materials, they show outstanding performance in aqueous electrolyte. So it's much better than, uh, than carbon. So this could be the next generation of materials for supercapacitors, but, but now we need to move from aqueous to non-aqueous electrolyte to enlarge the potential window and to increase the energy density. And this is really uh, the next challenge uh, uh, which is needed, how to understand how to make operating these materials in proton-free electrolytes. So this is a... Uh, this is uh, something we are, we are currently working on, but it's not that, uh, not that easy. So I would like to thank uh, uh, my, my colleague and friend, Professor Yuri Gotzi, for, um, uh, for his support, Pirate and so on, and all the sponsors. And I would like to thank my, my colleagues from the lab, my group with uh, Pierre-Louis Bernard and uh, Pierre-Louis Bernard here, my co-worker for four years, and Patrick, uh, Patrick Rosier, who is there. And I would like to thank you uh, a lot for your kind attention. Uh, some couple of minutes for uh, questions. Is there any question? Please. So you showed some really nice results towards the, the, um, the end of the first part of your talk on using um, olive as a different source of carbon uh, compared with you know, what you usually use and you, should, you showed a really nice uh, uh, result in, 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 in terms of capacitance. But um, you also explained that the uh, that the pore size is about the same as you obtained when you were using your previous carbons. So my question then is, why is it different? Because it's not just the pore size. Depending on the carbon that you use, then the surface is going to be different. You know, I can imagine there are going to be different concentrations of carbonyl groups or something else or something else, which then opens up another question. What do you do about, you know, there's another parameter. If you do ozone treatment or ammonia treatment, you know, you can also change the surface of the carbon. Sure, that's a very good point. I did not mention because it's, a, I would say, a general uh, topic. But clearly, uh, the CDC from uh, titanium carbide, these are modern materials. So uh, we use these materials because uh, uh, we can very nicely control the pore size because we just etch, in fact, the titanium. After, all these carbons are reduced under hydrogen. So we clean the surface from... Uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen groups, okay? So this is very important. So this is a hydrophobic surface. Then this kind of materials, they are just activated. They are prepared in the same way as porous carbon used in commercial devices are prepared. So these are not modern materials which are very expensive to, to make and so on. So in that way, um, we did these materials. You have a pore size distribution. It's not a unimodal pore size like CDC. And the idea was to try to control the pore size in this range here 
to take benefit, to, to take advantage of this uh, uh, quaion pair creation. And also, all these carbons have been reduced, annealed under hydrogen to clean, to remove a surface group. And your point regarding the surface group, it's, it has a huge impact. Hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity has a very important impact. And the presence of redox groups like oxygen onto the carbon surface changes the wettability in non-aqueous electrolyte and also as contributes to capacitance in aqueous electrolyte. So, but for our, I would say, approach, we want to get rid of these, uh, of these extra contributions to really study the double layer mechanism. Any other question? I have a short question from myself. Uh, you talk about uh, the influence of the porous density, porous sites on the capacitance. What is the influence on the conductivity of these uh, carbon uh, layers? Yeah, all these carbons, all the CDC carbons, are, they are not metallic for sure, they are semiconducting, but what is really limiting is not the electrical conductivity, it's the ionic conductivity inside the porous network. So from the electrical point of view, we, uh, we have no limitation. So we have enough, I will say, basically speaking, uh, we have enough electrical conductivity to polarize the carbon uh, with minimum ohmic loss. Then what is different is uh, the kind of uh, uh, ionic resistance inside the porous network. So this is more limiting the material than the electrical conductivity of a carbon by itself. So this is the, all the interest of this work with the uh, interface. Okay, let's go to thanks again to the Professor Paul Simon. Simon.